of a reverse order, but we'll be covering at the beginning some of the same topics because I want to make sure that people are up to speed as we go into the specific demo and use case that we're going to show in this particular session. So the agenda is, again, a quick review on, on Spark, and then we're going to jump into a machine learning overview because not everyone is necessarily familiar with that uh, topic, and I want to make sure we have at least some of the basics so you can follow what's going on as we go through more of the detailed slides as well as the demo itself. Uh, we'll talk about the Spark machine learning library um, that enables machine learning within Spark and some of the specifics of that. We'll talk very briefly about data science experience, which is the platform that we'll be running the demo on, and I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about that. And then we're going to um, talk specifically about recommender systems, and then specifically how that you can implement those using the Spark machine learning libraries. And then we'll go through a, a demo and we'll walk through it. Again, as, as in the previous a webinar, you know, the, the purpose is not to make you a, a be able to code this necessarily, although we can share uh, the uh, the code with you, but it's kind of give you high level concepts and how it's implemented uh, within the code that we'll, we'll see. And then we'll, we'll wrap up with some final statements. So again, a quick review on Spark. So Spark itself is a distributed computing framework. Um, that scales and has high performance because it does a lot of things very well uh, in memory. And then sitting on top of that is a, a data frame API, which allows you to organize the data kind of in a more row and column format that many of us are familiar with from relational databases. And we'll talk about that more later. later. And then there's several libraries that sit on top to do uh, more functions. And we'll cover that on, on the next slide. But within Spark itself, you can interface with these libraries with a number of uh, popular programming languages, uh, most specifically Python and uh, today and Scala, which Spark is, is written in, but also Java and R. And R is another very popular uh, language for data scientists. Uh, it wasn't there originally, and it's, it's probably not as far along as some of the other languages, but it's something that there's going to be a continued focus on. Uh, then if you can kind of see at the bottom, you know, Spark itself is not a, da a data store, it's a processing engine, and it can basically connect to any data store um, to retrieve the data. So that data could be uh, on-prem, in the cloud, in a relational database, uh, in a object storage um, file, or what, whatever it is that you, that you want to connect to, and you can read that uh, into, you know, your Spark processing environment and analyze the data from there. So here's a little bit more detail on the libraries themselves that Spark provides. The first one is uh, Spark Streaming. So this allows you to stream in data. Spark uses a micro batch approach uh, to do that. So it's not record by record processing. And there are other streaming uh, engines out there that allow you to do that. For, for, for most cases, you know, this may be good enough. And, and the, you know, the benefit with Spark is that it not only has that capability, but it ties in in the, in the consistent framework with all the other libraries uh, that are listed below here. Uh, machine learning is the one we're going to focus on second down is in, in this particular session, and we'll go into more detail on that. Uh, Spark SQL allows you to run SQL uh, statements and SQL queries uh, within Spark, and you'll see a few, a few examples of those. Uh, typically, it, well, it could be used for several things, but where we're going to use it uh, in this particular case is to do some data preparation and bring the data set uh, that we're going to be analyzing into Spark uh, for further analysis and, and to set it up for machine learning. And then the other one is, is GraphX. Um, graph processing allows you to represent your data in terms of nodes and edges and GraphX is really good at understanding, you know, because as important as the data itself, uh, in many cases and in, in many applications today, the relationship uh, between the data is the data points is equals important, sometimes more important. And GraphX is a library um, that allows you to analyze the data in that way. So there are several abstractions that Spark provides. It allows you to uh, work with the data in a, in a much easily and more consumable format. Uh, because one thing, when you, when you think about Spark, you know, it's going to be, in, because of its scalability, it's going to be running across a cluster or a large 
you know, number of, of compute environments. But you don't want to be concerned, like, well, uh, how many computers is it running on, or how many partitions is the data um, divided into? What these abstractions allow you to do is to access and uh, the data in a consist and get at it and operate on it in a consistent format by just calling a single object. And the two abstractions in the original one, the Spark had, is something called a re dis resilient distributed data set which is basically a distributed collection of objects, all of the same type that are distributed across uh, the cluster that your, that your Spark uh, framework is running on. And that was originally what came out, and you can, you can certainly still use that, but what people have gone to more recently are data frames. So, so what data frames basically does is it wraps a schema around the RDD, and it organizes it into named columns. So you can kind of think of this, you know, those are familiar with, you know, relational database, the, you know, the tables, the data frames will look like uh, tables. Or in, if you're familiar with other programming, uh, data science programming environments like R and Python, they also have the same concept of, of a data frame. So it makes Spark easier to work with um, and easier to develop applications. Uh, the other thing that it provides, if you look at the chart that's down on the bottom uh, corner of the slide, Originally, with with RDDs, there and in this particular um, in this particular plot, uh, smaller is better because this is the uh, you know this is how long it takes to actually run. And there was a difference between when you were running RDDs uh, between the various languages that you may be running in it, whether it was Python or Scala. But you can see when we went to uh, when Spark went to data frames. Um, number one, all of the time processing times got shorter because there's a lot of more optimizations that can be done in a data frame because Spark knows a lot more about the data where the RDDs are more opaque. But the other thing is all the language compiled down into the same format. So now you can basically choose the language that you want to use uh, based upon what's most, maybe most familiar to you or provides the functionality that you need rather than having to worry about performance differences. So let's talk a little bit about machine learning. So machine learning, a guy named Arthur Samuel, who worked for a time at IBM, uh, defined, defined machine learning as a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So in machine learning, you develop analytical models that you train, and those learned models can then make predictions on other data that it hasn't hasn't seen before, so it's again a way of doing uh, one way of doing predictive modeling, uh, and it allows you to to you know find insights in your data without explicitly programming where to look. You create the model, and then the model will help you to understand and and uh, you know to find those insights without saying okay I want to, it's not like a report where you're saying I want to specifically look at this particular item. A more formal definition of machine learning is, is quoted here. So this is um, from Tom Mitchell at Carnegie Mellon, which is widely used, uh, you know, and you can kind of read it. Uh, for our purposes, the one that we just looked at before it, it is fine. But if you're, you know, if you're taking a machine learning class at a university, um, you know, this is kind of a probably a more rigorous definition of what machine learning uh, is. But you know, what we talked about before is, is, is fine for our purposes. So some machine learning examples. Uh, so machine learning is, is ubiquitous today. So you can't go to a you know a website and you get pop-up advertisements. I mean, there's machine learning algorithms behind that, uh, determining what ads will be presented to you um, for credit card fraud. You know, determining whether a, a transaction is is fraudulent or not. Uh, to do stock stock market forecasting. Um, medical, medical diagnosis, you know, whether a, uh, you know, whether a tumor is malignant or benign uh, or a mole is, you know, skin, it has skin, indicates skin, skin cancer or not. Um, speech recognition, I mean, you talk into your phone, everyone into your mobile devices, everyone does this all today, Siri or whatever, um, this machine learning driving that and probably the most one that gets a lot of uh, press these days is autonomic uh, driving in, in cars. So again, it's all over and becoming, excuse me, more and more prevalent. 
there are two categories of machine learning and, and broken down into these two groups. So in supervised machine learning, you train an algorithm. So you have a predefined set of training examples. And the important thing about these training examples is they have labels. Labels are the right answers. So you have to have a, a data set where you have, you know, the what, what you're trying to find and what the right answers are. And you train an algorithm on that training data set. And then once the algor algorithm is, is, is trained, then you can present it with new data um, and it can predict what those labels are. Unsupervised le learning, on the other hand, there are no labels. This is where you just have data and you're asking the machine learning uh, algorithm to find structure in it. So an example of this is you may have, a, say, customer profile data and you want to break your customers um, down into, say, market segments and have the have the uh, machine learning algorithm try to break it up into into different clusters. So that that would be an example of that. In, in this particular uh, use case that we're going through in the demo that we're going to see is going to be an example of uh, supervised learning. So a machine learning process, you know, is is very involved and potentially complex. Has a lot of steps. There's a lot of iteration. Uh, and kind of learning from what you've done. But, you know, it starts with an understanding of the business problem, um, you know, deciding on an analytical approach that you want to take, finding out, well, what data do I need in order to uh, do this, uh, and then go ahead and collecting that data, understanding the data that you collected, uh, and then that may be, you know, an iterative cycle in itself, and then preparing the data, um, and, you know, you may need to go back and collect more data or change the data. And then finally, once you have all that, then you can start looking at, you know, the machine learning um, and modeling and, and training and, and algorithm. Uh, and then you're going to do some evaluation on the algorithm to see how well you're doing. Um, and then you may deploy it. And then you're going to get feedback on the, you know, on the uh, deployment of the model. And obviously there may be room for improvement or things change over time, your data changes over time and the algorithm needs to adjust to that. And you know, so then there's another big loop there. So we're only touching the surface on this. I just want to give you this as an idea of the, you know, the, the full breadth of a machine learning process. What we're going to be focusing on, uh, you know, in this particular uh, session in the demo is just the two blocks down here, the evaluation and the modeling components of it. But just be aware that there's a lot more to it than kind of what we're be showing you here. Um, so just a few other things that you know we're going to see that we're going to do in our machine learning steps. One of them is cross validation. So when I have a machine learning model, you know, how do I then um, you know determine that this is you know the best fit model uh, for what I'm, I'm trying to do? And typically models have uh, algorithms in in, uh, in data science and machine learning have a number of parameters say uh, that you can tune. And so there is a cross validator class in Spark ML that allows you to um, take as an input an estimator, which is your uh, basically your algorithm, and a set of parameter maps where you're going to define these these uh, parameters that you want to tune and various values that you want to try, and then an evaluator which basically is saying, well, how good am I doing? And that's going to depend on the situation. The one that we're going to use is something called root mean square error, uh, which means we're going to see how far off we are uh, between the, um, you know, between the, what we predicted and what the right answer should be, uh, and then square it and take the, the square root. But there are other, and then that, that makes sense for certain things, but there are other machine learning approaches where there are uh, different evaluators that may, um, that may be more applicable. And the text classification uh, webinar that did, we did uh, last month, uh, it, there were, you know, it was more of a classification one. So there was a, a classification use case. So it was a, there was a different estimator that, that we used for that. So the cross value data will iter iterate through the parameter maps and try, basically try all combinations and do a cross product of all of those uh, to find out which is the uh, which is the best combination. So this thing that cross validation the cross validator is working on our hyperparameters. So again, as I just mentioned, the algorithms themselves have a number of, of these hyperparameters. You can kind of think of them as knobs on the algorithms that you can uh, you can use to tune the model. 
the thing is, these are separate from what the model itself, when you're doing the machine learning, learning and training of the model, what it's being optimized for. Those are basically called coefficients. So it's creating some kind of algorithm and it's going to have some, you know, the, the features or variables that you're looking at, and then there are going to be some coefficients uh, associated with those. That's what the machine learning, when you learn a machine learning model, that's what it's figuring out. Um, these are in addition to that, and we'll, we'll see examples of, of what some of these are uh, when we go through the, uh, the demo itself. So one of them is, uh, I'll, just, I'll just call out here, and, and we're going to, um, when we do the cross-validation, this is one of the ones that we're going to uh, investigate and, and look at different values of, is uh, something called the regularization parameter. So when you're creating a machine learning model, um, there's always, the, the, the problem is, you know, getting the model as best as, as possible. And the two extremes are underfitting the model or overfitting the model. Um, so you can kind of see those represented here in these graphs. Now, this is for a, uh, a say, a, a regression type of analysis, which is not what we're doing here, but it's easy to, uh, you know, kind of depict graphically so that you can kind of get the sense of, of, of what these mean. You know, what we're going to be doing here is a little bit different, but the concept is the same. So underfitting means that, you know, I, I really just did not fit the, the data points well enough. So when I go to make predictions, um, it's not going to, um, you know, give me the best, best results. And you can see the just right one, you know, seems to match uh, the data pretty well. But if you go um, too crazy, you can also have the uh, possibility of overfitting the data. So the problem with overfitting the data is the data that you train the model with, it'll actually work very well and you'll get great results. But then when you give it data, um, you know, new data that it wasn't trained against, it, it's, it's going to have problems with that. So you need to be careful on, on both sides of it. And there is a parameter, a hyperparameter uh, for regulation uh, that's used in machine learning to kind of balance this. And, and that's one of the things we'll be uh, looking at when we, uh, and changing when we do our cross-validation. All right, so that's it for the, uh, you know, kind of overview of machine learning. Let's talk about how that gets implemented in, in Spark ML. So Spark ML is Spark's machine learning library, and we, we kind of saw that in one of the earlier slides. So this is a library in addition to, like, Spark Streaming and, and Graph uh, X as, as well as Spark SQL. And has a number of common uh, learning algorithms that you can use. Um, so, such as classification, again, the example is this transaction fraudulent or not, uh, regression, say if we you had a number of, um, you were trying to estimate housing prices and you had a number of features on the housing, house, you know, number of square foot, uh, how many bedrooms and bathrooms it has, the age of the house and so forth, and come up with a model uh, to be able to predict housing prices, <coughs> excuse me, clustering, um, you know, that was more the unsupervised learning. <coughs> where I may, you know, want to take my customers and, and segment them. Collaborative filtering is the one we're going to talk about in much more detail uh, in this particular session. <coughs> Excuse me. And then uh, dimensionality reduction is to, uh, you know, in many cases doing machine learning, you can have a huge number of, of features and be able to kind of find out what the most important ones are. SparkML uses a number of lower level, level uh, primitives uh, to be able to accomplish this, and we're going to investigate some of those. It also has some higher level pipelines where you can string uh, the primitives together to do things like all in one pipeline, the feature engineering, uh, the, then the training of the model and the evaluation of the model. We're not going to look at that this particular session. If you want to go back and look at the recording of the one that we did last month on text analytics, um, we did use pipelines in that particular uh, demo use case. So I just want to spend a minute on the actual platform that we're going to be running the demo on. So IBM has a, uh, a platform out there called Data Science Experience, uh, and at its heart, it uses um, Spark processing engines. Uh, you can see the URL here where you can go ahead and, and, and sign up, and you can get a, uh, a free account that you can try it on. So it's basically just datascience.ibm.com. And this is basically the tool for a data scientist. So it allows a data scientist um, to learn because you can look at this 
tons of examples there and tutorials um, you know to create these um, you know highly analytic products um, using these the open source components in the data science experience and also it provides like collaboration and you see that when I go in you can you can create projects and uh, you know have people working together and facilitate that that type of collaboration so this is the platform that we're going to be we're not going to go into a lot of detail on the platform uh, features itself but you'll kind of see when we do the demo that this is the environment that we'll be running on for those of you who are not familiar and, and had attended the, the previous webinars uh, what is very popular in you know in spark with data scientists today are, is this concept of a notebook and the one we're going to be using is a, uh, a Jupyter notebook this came out of Python uh, but now it supports a, a number of different languages uh, and it's a it's basically a browser based document um, that includes you know the uh, actual code that you want to run as well as text comments you can include in, in visualizations and, and even media if you want um, the nice thing about it is that it allows you to uh, to build up your application in code cells so you can do a kind of piecemeal but also it's, it's interactive and that you can you know you can kind of like one run one section and get a result back and then make changes and again it's it's just very conducive uh, to you know productive uh, you know exploration of data using these data science and, and in particular in this scenario that we're going to look at today uh, you know machine learning algorithms uh, the other thing is it can be shared uh, you know by both technical and line of business users typical the technical users are the ones that are going to be developing it and then the line of business users uh, you know would be able to to you know view and, and use it all right so let's talk about recommendation systems themselves so recommender systems basically predict the rating or preference that a user would give to an item so we, we've all seen these right you know you go on to um, you know you go on to a dot com website you go on to Amazon uh, you know you choose something and they're going to recommend to you whatever five other products that you may also be interested in you go on a uh, movie website like Netflix uh, and you're, you're looking at movies and they will recommend movies to you so these are you know these are happening there and are used all, all over the place and they basically are an attempt to improve, you know, the customer uh, experience. You know, today, you know, marketing is all about one-on-one -on -one marketing, right? So you want to have personal uh, recommendations that you can, uh, you know, that you can give to your users. Uh, they are, you know, again, as I already mentioned, extremely popular today for all over from the stuff that I already mentioned, like products and musics, but recommending um, uh, news stories, um, you know, you can use research articles, whatever it is, any any product, which doesn't have to be a physical product, but that you can kind of categorize that way, uh, can be used with a, a recommender system. The actual technique that there's, there's other ways to do it, but the one that we're going to be exploring uh, in this particular use case is something called collaborative filtering. And it's commonly used for recommender systems. In fact, it's it's the most popular technique that that's used today uh, so most people uh, you know when, when you talk about recommender systems are are typically talking about collaborative filtering I uh, will talk a little bit about it in more detail but it's basically a, a wisdom of the crowd approach uh, meaning you know I understand uh, with my group of you call them users customers whatever what products or services they bought and then I know for you what products or services you bought and based upon you know what you bought and what they bought and the similarities uh, you can make recommendations on you know what we would want to um, you know potentially recommend to this to this user there are other ways um, to do it I mean there's, there's recommender systems that are based on things like content um, so for instance if you were doing song recommendations or movie recommendations I mean you may want to you know devise uh, features about those those songs or, or movies you know whether they're uh, you know they're an action movie romantic movie as well as a whole bunch of of, of other things and then as you know kind of more traditional uh, machine learning approaches use those features to make the to make the recommendations 
the problem with that and for this type of application is, you know, what are those features and which ones are important and who comes up with those, right? You know, so for a movie, you know, how to classify it and stuff like that. It's um, quite subjective. Uh, so typically they haven't been found and this is why people have kind of really gravitated around collaborative filtering and we'll see in some of the more detailed uh, technical slides in a minute. The thing about collaborative filtering is what we typically think of like, you know, as, as features in, in machine learning, you know, kind of the attributes that we're learning around. Those don't really exist in collaborative filtering. They're actually learned by the model um, themselves. So we call those latent features. Uh, and you'll see that in, in some of the, uh, the slides that are upcoming. So it's, it's again, I, the, what I wanted to come away with, this is a, a different, a little bit different approach than some of the other machine learning approaches you may have seen. And, and most importantly is that the features themselves are learned uh, and they're not, they're not given up front and they don't necessarily have to exist uh, in, the, in the data. So there are several forms of collaborative filtering. Uh, one is called explicit. So this is where the user provides uh, specific feedback ratings as an example. So you go ahead and rate movies, and and a, and a movies database has a you know has a record of all the movies you rated, say from one one to five, which is something along the lines of what we're going to look at in the demo. Another one could be uh, ex, um, could be to use implicit uh, features. Um, this could be a case where you know you, something didn't rate it, but you're looking at you know whether if if, if you're trying to um, figure out what ad uh, to you know, to, to provide to someone on a website, well, you know, what are their click through rates and stuff like that. So there are other things that you can use. So those are called implicit because they're, you know, they're just characteristics about what the person did that relate to what you're trying to recommend, but they're not a specific explicit rating of, of, the, of the product itself. So Spark ML, um, the way that it, it actually implements this is it uses a matrix factorization technique uh, for collaborative filtering. And again, for collaborative filtering, make, and we'll see this in a minute, matrix factorization is, is pretty much what most people use today. It's kind of the, uh, you know, the, the state of the art and, and what is shown to, ex to perform extremely well uh, with current technology uh, for collaborative filtering. Uh, this next statement, I'll, I'll kind of read it. There's a little bit of technical detail in here, but we'll look at it more graphically in the next slide. So collaborative filtering aims to fill in the missing entries of a user item association matrix in which users and items are described by a small set of latent factors that can be used to predict missing entries. So first of all, we have this user item association matrix. So these may be a bunch of users rated a bunch of movies. I mean, it's just something like that, or some, you can call them whatever you want. Some customers rated a bunch of, of, of products. So we have that association uh, matrix. But the other key line item in, uh, you know, uh, segment fragment in here is small set of latent factors. This is what I was talking about before in that, you know, you're not specifically specifying these are the features that I'm looking at. So I'm not saying like that, you know, I have these movies and I classify them as action movies or love stories or long movies or short movies or recent movies or classic movies. I'm not defining um, those features. And in many cases, that may be difficult to come up with what the relevant features are. Um, we're going to use this kind of more wisdom of the crowd approach that we discussed previously. This is the most technical slide in, in the deck and don't get scared by the uh, math. We're just gonna kind of talk about it at a high level. So the actual algorithm that does collaborative filtering in Spark ML is something called alternating uh, least squares. And this is the thing that learns those latent factors. And it uses a technique called uh, matrix, factor, uh, matrix factorization. So what it does is it iteratively solves a series of least square problems to derive the model. So if you kind of look at the, the graphics down here, you kind of see I have this make this rating matrix. So this is kind of what we've been talking about in, in words, right? I have these number of users and number of movies, and they've rated a number of these. So at these intersections of these would be the, the rating value, say from, from one to five. Um, so one thing to notice about this is that this matrix is probably sparsely populated because hopefully if you have like, you know, um, 
thousands or 10,000 movies, um, you know, one user has not, or most users have not uh, rated, watched, nor rated uh, any large fraction of that. And so what happens in the matrix factorization is we kind of break this down into two smaller matrices. One is just the users and one is, is just the movies. And the way this works is, not without getting into a lot of details, is that the algorithm will, uh, by default, initialize one of these, say the, the users. And then based upon that, and this is just a, a fact of linear algebra, if you have one of the, it'll, it'll fill the entire user matrix. And then based upon that, um, the movie matrix can be calculated. And then it will multiply those together. And at the intersection points that match what's in the ratings matrix, it will see how close it came. And it will use a least squares approach. Um, so it'll, it'll, take the, um, it'll take the difference uh, between what it predicted and what's in, in calculated by doing this, uh, this uh, cross multiplication. And then what's actually in the ratings matrix and find, find the difference and that's a, and square it, and that's a least squared. And then it, what, it, what it'll do is, okay, make modifications. Now it'll go ahead and, and make changes to the movies uh, and then calculate what the users are, do that uh, cross product again, and then see how close I am evaluating it using least squares. And it'll go back and forth and do that till it can either converges on an answer or you can specify, which we will in our demo, what the maximum number of um, iterations is to do that. So that's in a nutshell. And if you're really interested in the, uh, the math, um, that's kind of the math of, of what we were talking about. Um, the other thing I want to highlight here, this lambda, is that regularization parameter that we talked about that manages the, the overfit. All right, so now we're uh, ready to move into the, uh, the demo component. So I'm going to just switch over to a browser. So what you can see here, this is the... Uh, interface for uh, data science experience. Uh, I actually, I'm not going to go through the, you know, the, the, all the features of data science experience. And basically, you know, like I mentioned before, it's project based. So this analytical asset, which is a notebook, resides in a project. And then you can have multiple projects. Um, you can have multiple data sources. Uh, and then you can have multiple collaborators in a, pro in a project and you can assign them various levels of permission from admin to edit to view to view only. But so assuming I, you know, I'm, I'm, I own this and I'm, I'm in this notebook. Um, so this is the, uh, you know, the Jupyter notebook that we uh, talked about. And it's broken basically down into these number of, of cells and we'll kind of see these in more detail. That's one cell and then some other cells below it. Um, just quickly, what I want you to notice is the cells um, consist of uh, markdown, which is a, basically a way to comment, right? And, the, and you can have some structure uh, to it. Um, there are markdown um, attributes you can set like to bold and make different sizes and so forth. Uh, but then there's also the, um, the code itself. Um, this, this notebook is, is written in, in the Scala programming language. Uh, it's running on Spark 2.0. The reason that I use Scala, it mostly could have done it in Python, uh, but I wrote this uh, notebook uh, several months ago in Spark version 1.6, and at the time, uh, 1.6 Python did not have some of the classes I need, specifically that cross-validator class, um, so I had to write it in Scala. Now that it's in 2.0, that is there, and I could probably um, rewrite this in, in Python. But the differences are very small. Uh, for what we're doing here. The APIs look similar from a Spark perspective uh, in both languages. So here's a comment that kind of talked about what we did before. Uh, and then again, I, I talked about the fact that this, um, you know, requires it requires 1.6 or greater, but we're running on 2.0. And then here I'm, I'm just showing you that, um, you know, that I'm, I'm printing out the Spark version. And you can see here that it is running on, on Spark 2.0.1. Uh, so the next step that we're doing, and, and the, the, the notebook itself and data science experience exposes the Spark context uh, for you out of the box. So it's, it's, a, it's available uh, for you to use. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Spark 2.0, um, there's a super class of the Spark context and SQL context now called Spark. So I could have said Spark.version. I just kept what I, what I had before, but it, it could certainly be written 
uh, in Spark 2.0. I kept it that way so it could run in, in both uh, Spark 1.6 and, and 2.01. Um, you can certainly change it if you want it just to run in, in Spark 2. Right, here I'm just importing all the various libraries, uh, but you can see a lot of these have to do with the, uh, you know, the using uh, alternating least squares, the regression evaluator uh, to do the, um, the least square, you got to use um, the, uh, the least square calculation uh, and, and a number of other, other things. And, and those will be deployed uh, down below. Um, what I did want to skip back because I, um, I uh, negligently went a little bit too fast here is kind of set up uh, the demo a little bit more and then we'll go back to the notebook. Uh, so what we are using for the for the demo is this uh, movie lens one million data set. So here's the uh, here's the web address here. You can go ahead and uh, go look to that address. You can download this. A uh, movie lens is like a recommender system. Uh, you know, it recommends movies to use. So you can kind of think it, um, you know, sort of like uh, Netflix, at least in terms of the recommendation uh, end of things. Um, and the data set that we're going to use has more than one million. Uh, ratings and of approximately 4,000 movies uh, made by 6,000 users in 2000, and, and we'll see we'll see all of that. Um, this is what the uh, there's actually two data sets. This is what the rating ones look like. So it has a, a user ID, a movie ID, um, the actual rating that was given to it, and then a, and then a, and a timestamp. Um, the other thing to notice is that it, it's pipe delimited. These two, um, basically two, two colons, and you see that when we when we read in the data. Um, there's also a movies uh, movies data set, and basically that has the movie ID, uh, the title of the movie, and then the genre. Uh, the genres are I think broken down into like 20, 20, 20 different genres, and each one is assigned there. Not so much um, needed for our uh, for our collaborative filtering because we're not. We're not using any features like that to make the decision. Again, we're using that wisdom, wisdom of the crowd approach. So the demo flow, and we'll, we'll skip back to right back to the notebook after this, is we're going to read in these ratings and movie data sets. Then we're going to convert them to Spark data frames, which is that abstraction that we talked about. Then we're going to split the ratings into multiple data sets so we can do training on some and then test on others because you want to evaluate your model on data that you didn't train with. Um, then we're going to actually build the model on the training using the training data using the alternate least squares approach that we talked about. Uh, then we're going to run the model against the test data to get some sample predictions. And then we'll do an initial evaluation of our model uh, by computing root mean square error, as I discussed previously. That's our evaluator. Um, then we're going to tune the model looking at various hyperparameters, one of them in particular uh, being the, um, uh, you know, the to make sure that we're not doing uh, the overfitting. And then we'll finally wrap up with showed how to use the, the uh, algorithm that we came up with to actually recommend movies to a user. And we'll do that, we'll do that within the, within the notebook itself. So let me go back to the notebook and, and data science experience and we'll pick up. So without going to all the details here and the reason I did it this way is um, the data science experience also has object storage that comes with it. So you could have loaded, I could have loaded this data, not, the data files aren't that big, uh, to object storage. But to make it simpler and in case you, whatever environment that you wanted to run this on, I just download, downloaded the data directly uh, within the notebook. So what all the, the syntax is basically operating system commands. So I, I'm just, um, you know, using wget to go get that that file which exists here on that, you know, on this web address. Um, so I'm, I'm bringing that down uh, into the Spark environment so we can use that data. And then you, um, so then you can see that the, um, the that, that file does exist. It was a zip file. And then all I'm here within the notebook, again, these are more OS level commands. I'm just unzipping uh, that zip file. And, you know, we get all the, um, we get all the underlying uh, files. And then if I do an LS, I can see there's the, uh, the, the movies and the ratings one, which there's other files. Well, there's a readme file and then there's a users one, um, which not, we're not going to use for this uh, particular purpose. So now we have the files here on 
uh, local storage. Um, this is not something that you would do in production. This is just scratch storage that happened to exist within the Spark instance um, that I'm using, um, but it's not guaranteed, and you know you wouldn't do this uh, except for kind of the you know demo purposes to take this approach, except for the you know demo purpose like I'm, I'm doing here. So what we're going to do next is we're going to read the uh, we're going to read that this one's the rating file into a RDD. So the, the result of this is an RDD called ratings uh, underscore raw. And I'm using a uh, method on the Spark context called text file in order to do that. And then just taking a sample of the output. And you can see this is kind of what I showed you on the slide. So I just wanted to show you that's what the, uh, the data looked like. Then what we're going to do is convert this into a data frame. Um, so I'm using something called the case class, which is a facility in, in Scala that you can do kind of pattern matching. Um, and all I'm doing is uh, I'm, I'm going to create a case class that has the various columns that I'm interested in and then what data types they are. And then I'm going to map my RDD uh, splitting on that pipe. And then I'm going to map it to this case class and then I'm casting uh, to the type of data types that I want. So rating is an integer. Uh, a movie ID, uh, user ID, and movie ID are integers, and, and rating is a uh, is a full value. And then if we go ahead and now look at now we have that um, we have that data set, and we have and we can look and see that the number of ratings was about a million, which is which was why it was called the million the million data set. Uh, we can go ahead and look at a sample of the data frame that we created. And so you can see we have the user ID, movie ID, and ratings. And again, those are integers and the ratings is a, uh, is a, is a flow. And then just, you know, you, I just was just an example to show how you can do SQL to kind of analyze your data up front. So, you know, I just, just a SQL statement doing the group by on user ID and counting um, to kind of see, well, how many, how many uh, movies did people rate? And you can see for each of the user ID, you can see how many ratings they had. We're not really using that. This was kind of just more instructive to show, excuse me, how you could use Spark SQL to analyze the data within within the notebook as you're as you're looking at it. And then you know we can go ahead and show that the number of users in the data set is approximately six thousand by count by now that we group them together by counting that, and we can see there are six excuse me, 6,000 users. Then we're going to go ahead and do the same thing with the uh, the movies data set. It's a, 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 a similar process. We read it using this text file method into an RDD. And then we're going to use that same approach that I did above using the case class <coughs> and basically mapping it to that case class and then converting it um, to a, a data frame. And again, the case class is uh, you know assigning the um, the column names and then the data types, and I end up with this this data frame right here. So now I have that ratings and I have movies that data in a, a data frame. Uh, there were other ways to do this. Uh, uh, Spark itself has a, a, a data frame reader that can uh, parse CSV, format it, and 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 I could have potentially used that here too. It actually may have been simpler. Uh, because it had that pipe, it wasn't a uh, you know comma delimiter, but you can't change in the data frame reader. You can't change the delimiter to something else. So I probably could have got this work a little bit easier, but this uh, this does the job. And then if we count in the number of users, we can see it's like 3883, which we said are about 4,000. All right, so now we're ready to start doing um, some work. So we're gonna we're gonna split into uh, that the the uh, ratings data frame. Uh, into two other, into two separate data frames in a ratio of 80 20. Um, so you can see here I'm doing a random split on them and I'm splitting them on, on 80 20 uh, to, to, get two, to, to get two data sets now that we're going to use one for training and, and one for testing. And then here, all of this is I'm basically doing is, um, is counting, counting them. And all this other stuff that's out there with complicated it was just a format so that I got decimals with two uh, uh, precision with two uh, two numbers after the after the decimal point but all I want to show you that it did come out into a, approximately an 80 20 uh, percentage breakdown as we expected 
Uh, and then we can go through and look at the, uh, excuse me, went a little bit too fast there. We can look at the, uh, the test and ratings data set. And again, they look the same as what we saw before, except they're uh, basically broken down now into uh, two separate data frames. All right, all that was all prepped. So now we're ready to actually train the model. Um, so the uh, algorithm that we're going to use is the alternating least squares as we discussed in the slides. And then there are a bunch of setter methods that you can use to get input uh, to the uh, algorithm as, as building the model. And so a few of these are important. Uh, one is setting, so it, again, this was a, we're trying to do this user item correlation. So there are two methods called set user column and set item column. So in the data frame, I need to tell it which one's the user and which one's the item. They can be called whatever they want in the data frame. Um, but our user ID, if we go back up to the, uh, uh, for the user column, our user ID was user ID and our item ID was movie ID. So all I'm doing here is, is telling it that's where it is. So now when I feed it the data frame, it knows what, what columns I'm looking at. And then um, I'm setting the rating column. You know, what it is that we're using is the rating column. And again, that was, that was rating. The other thing I'm, I'm doing here is uh, these are hyperparameters um, that we could change and look at to tune the model. I'm setting the number of iterations. So again, that when it was doing that matrix factorization, how many times it goes back and forth. Um, you probably may want to do this more and then cut it back once you understand. I just didn't want this to run a long time. Uh, my purpose here wasn't to come up necessarily with the best model, but to show you the techniques of, of how you do that. And then I set the regularization parameter to 0 0.01. And that's something that we're going to uh, have a change when we do the cross validation. Um, so now I, these are all the parameters that we define. And there's a way to actually look at it. There's a method on ALS called explain parameters. Uh, and you can see just what I kind of annotated here in Markdown. Uh, you can see it. It's those, those same values are all in here. So we changed the user a column ID and it's telling you the default is user, uh, but we change it to user ID because that's what was named in our particular uh, data frame. Uh, the other one important one that I wanted to pull out here and, uh, is this is this one called rank. So remember we talked about that idea of, you know, when we're doing this collaborative filtering, we're not actually feeding it specific features that we define. We're giving it this user item matrix and the algorithm itself is going to determine uh, these features, the, these latent features that, you know, they may not even be assignable or something that we can, you know, uh, define in English, uh, but it's what the, the model uses. And this is that, you know, the number of rows and columns and the two uh, factorized matrices. And the default is 10. You can change this, but I just wanted to show you that that was what was uh, there. Okay, so now that we have, um, we, we set up this model uh, and we gave it using the uh, set parameters, we, we set various characteristics, you know, what are the columns we're using and any hyperparameters. So the way that you actually, the way that you actually train the model is by calling transform on the model, which we call model, and then you feed it the data set. So we're going to, we're, we're um, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to run the model against the test data set to show uh, predictions because we when you ran, when you create a model uh, it becomes a transformer then when you want to make predictions which we did above then when you want to make predictions you call transform on it and so now this is it creates another data frame um, that adds a column called predictions to it and then if we call and just look at a sample of that of that new data frame you can see um, and it showed the top 10 top 10 rows of the 10 rows of that, you can see there is now a, a prediction column. So to summarize what we did, we trained a model with a test data frame so far. Uh, we then made predictions because we had split it in 80-20 and now we're making predictions with the 20% test data set. And then here we're able to look at, okay, here's what our model predicted. Here's, because all our data was labeled, right? We're not using the label uh, to make predictions. Uh, it only uses the uh, user ID and movie, but we still have that available in our data set. And what this allows us to do is basically compare them. 
So we can see that, you know, it, it made predictions. They're not necessarily all that great. Here predicted four and it was 3.3 and you can, you can kind of read these. But again, this at least shows you the process of how we could make predictions uh, using the, uh, you know, using the data. And then because this data is already labeled, uh, we can see how it compares uh, to the ratings that are in the data. So now we want to do a more formal evaluation, a mathematical evaluation of, of how well we did. Um, so there is an evaluator class uh, called uh, for, for specifically for doing uh, things like this, and it's a regression evaluator. And again, it has these same set methods that like we were familiar with and talked about before. So you got to give it the label columns uh, that you're using for your label and the prediction, and that was the label. That, rating and prediction up above in that data frame. But the other thing you need to do is tell it what kind of metric you're using. And there are different ones available. The one I just choose to do here is called root mean square error. So it's going to basically subtract um, the, uh, the prediction from the rating, square it, and then take the square root of it. And that's what we're going to, we're going to look at as to tell how, as an evaluator criteria to, to see how, how good we're doing. And so when it, um, you know, when it, when it does all that and, and, makes those calculations on all our, our predictions, it comes out to like 8.89. So, okay, not that great. You know, it's almost a full uh, rating point, but it's a it, it's a starting point. And then this is just showing you that, obviously, uh, there's a method called is larger better, and it comes back as false, which means a smaller number uh, and the is better. Different evaluators may be different, but this is, I mean, it's intuitively obvious, but just wanted to validate it there. That smaller means better. If you had a root mean square base closer to zero, uh, it would be better than one closer to one. Now, what we're going to do is um, tune the model. Um, so this is where we're going to create a parameter grid and look at different combinations of hyperparameters. So this is a class called Parameter Grid Builder, uh, and then we're going to add a grid, and then we're going to tell it, okay, what algorithm I'm looking at. In this case, the alternating least squares. Uh, and then what parameter is particularly the alternating least squares use. We're using the regularization parameter for overfitting. There were other ones that was that one like rant for latent features and stuff. And we could have added another one of these, uh, but I didn't. This is just a, you know, just a simple example. Uh, and then you feed it an array of the values that you want to, um, to evaluate against. So we do 0 0.01, which is actually the, 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 what I had defined above, but then an additional one called 0.1. And what you need to pass those value in is as, a, as an array type. So that's that's why that array is there. So I created this parameter grid. So these are the values, the different combinations of values that are going to be evaluated. And then I use the cross evaluator model. And then I set it up like I did before using these set methods telling it like, um, you know, what algorithm I'm using, what evaluator I'm using, which is this, uh, you know, the root mean square error that we talked about above. You know, what parameter grids that I'm using, uh, which is the one I, I just defined here. We could have multiple ones of those. And then the, um, the number of folds. Um, just quickly, what folds allows, what does is it takes the data, and you don't need to separate it manually into test and training data sets. It will do that. So when I have two folds, it'll break the, the, um, the data evenly in half, and then I'll use one for test and one for training. If I had three, it would take a third of the data and use it for um, training. It, we use it for test and then use one for training. And then it would keep alternating what, what um, partition of the data was used. And it would do that three times. Um, so that's, that's what folds does. I just kept it simple and did uh, two. You can look at you know what, what I have the parameter map set at by using this get estimated parameter uh, method uh, right here. And you can see those. And now we're going to basically cross evaluate to find uh, the best model. So just like we did before, when we fit train the model using the fit up up up, up above, this time we're doing it not on uh, the, the you know just a simple model, but the cross validated one. And we're going to fit that against the the training uh, against the training set. And then we're going to look at um, again doing you looking at the evaluator and see how how well we did. Uh, with these predictions. Um, so when you look at the result of this, it didn't really make much improvement. So again, the, the purpose here wasn't to necessarily fine tune the model and you can try this on your own, but was to show kind of the process. So there may be other parameters um, that you may want to use that would allow you to, um, 
you know, to to fine tune this a little bit better. But this is the process of how you how you set it up and do it. Um, one other note, you know, I probably should have split the data into three data sets rather than just test and training. Typically, what you see is people will do test training and cross validation because you want to train the model on one set of data, you want to test it on on something else, then you want to cross validate it on different data that wasn't trained against, but then also you want to go back and test it. Um, and so it may have been, you know, probably best practice to have three data sets, but I just again kept it a little bit simple. Um, I know we're running out of time. I'm just going to go through this very quickly. So now the idea is, okay, we have this trained model. We have a best fit model called CV model that, you know, evaluated all the different hyperparameter calculations and came up with the uh, yeah, combinations and came up with the best fit. Well, how do I now predict it against it? So what I need to do is I need to, I'm going to predict it. I'm just I'm randomly picking a user called 3000. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, you know, I just did some SQL here and showed out, you know, here are the movies, um, the three um, user 3000 watched and looked at some calculations on him in SQL, looking at like the min, max, and average. Um, so you can see, you know, what kind of rater this guy was, right? So he did great sum at one and one of five. So he went across the whole gamut and then was, you know, on the higher side, 3.2, but I think most people uh, tend to rate movies a little bit higher anyways. Uh, and then we can look at, you know, the top 10 movies um, that this uh, person rated. So I, basically just joining uh, between the uh, the ratings and the movies data set so that I can get not only the ratings of movies, but also the names associated with them. So that's just more a uh, standard SQL. Um, but we want to understand what movies the, uh, the user has not watched because we want to rec recommend and not watch one movie to it. So this is a, a SQL similar to above, except we got this little exclamation or bang in front of it to say, you know, those movies not watched by that, that user ID. But then again, that also doesn't give us what we want because we want to take, we want not only what he um, didn't watch, but we, but we also want any of the other movies that are, that are available. And so what it what it turns out to be the way to to do this, and uh, you know, for those who remember, you know, some SQL joint strategies, is you actually want to do, and I just want to highlight it quickly. You just you basically want to do a a right outer join uh, to get that information. So when we go ahead and then do that right outer join, we get the data that we want to be able to feed into the model uh, to do predictions. And all I'm here is just showing you if I do calculations, um, you know, that we had started out with 38. Uh, 3,800 plus movies. The number of movies rated by this user was 106, so we calculated using SQL above, and then using this right outer join, the number of movies not rated by the person was 3777. And you can see these numbers add up. It was just a sanity check to show that, you know, what we kind of did the right, the right analysis. And so now to do predictions, we're just going to take that data frame, but remember we have to provide to the um, model a movie ID and the user ID. Well, we're interested, we're, these are the movies for user 3000, so we're interested in, we need to have a data frame that has the movie ID and the user ID of 3000. So we're basically just taking the data frame we had above and we're adding a column with, with column called user ID, and then we're just giving it a literal of user ID, a value of user ID equals user ID, which was set to 3000 above. And you can see now I get a data frame of, uh, uh, you know, with a column of 3,000. And so this is all set up now to run to run predictions. And so kind of as we did before for the mixed data set, but this one only has the values of movies for 3,000, we're going to take our cross-validated model, um, we're going to run it on that data, uh, and then all I'm doing here is then taking the results of the, uh, of the predictions, and then I'm just, I'm just sorting it in descending order because I wanted to show them the top ones, and then I'm, um, and then I'm, I'm only limiting the amount that we show them to ten. So that in a mouthful was the, um, you know, was the, uh, was the notebook and the way that you do it. And then just quickly going back to the, uh, to the slides here. So again, we took through you through a demo flow of how to, um, you know, how to create and construct the notebook. Uh, hopefully it makes sense within the context of the notebook, and this is something that we can follow up and give you um, so you could look at it in, uh, in more detail. Uh, and in, in, in summary, uh, and before I go to the summary, one thing I just did want to point out 
is that, you know, collaborative filtering is not necessarily the be all end all. It, it does have a, some issues that I, I didn't mention. For instance, take a, a, a scenario uh, where you have a new user uh, to your system, right? He has no history, right? So we don't have, um, you know, any history of what, say, movies um, that he already likes so that we can do that collaborative filtering compared to other people. So that that's an issue. And there are different ways to handle it. Like, um, you know, if you go on Amazon, if you're a new, a new user, the way that they would do it is they would just look at the top globally, um, you know, popular items in a particular category and recommend those until you build up a history on someone. So there are things you do need to consider outside of what we talked about here uh, when you're doing uh, collaborative filtering. But hopefully you got an idea of, you know, what some of the steps are, um, you know, how this fills into the, you know, into, into Spark and its machine learning library, some of the algorithms uh, that we use and, and that you can kind of take maybe as this is a starting point. As I mentioned, I didn't really um, over, I didn't really spend a lot of time tuning everything, uh, but you can kind of look at that and, and look at some of the different values and, and try to get the, um, you know, the error uh, a little bit closer, you know, rather than, you know, something much less than one rating point. So Ann, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I don't know if we have any time for questions. I know Lynn a little bit over, but I wanted to get all the uh, the content in. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, so most of most of the questions were regarding uh, whether we can make this presentation and the notebook available, and uh, and I said uh, yes. We're recording the webinar, so tomorrow an email will go out with a link to the recorded webinar. And I'm sorry about my dog. Um, with a link to the record the webinar and um, and we can attach the presentation and uh, and the notebook. There's only uh, one question that's outstanding that I that I that I didn't answer, and um, it's a question about whether data frames have the same resiliency capabilities as an RDD. So I don't know if that's something you can address quickly. Yeah, the answer is 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 yes in terms of the. Um, uh, the way it builds up the the lineage and uh, can rebuild that uh, on the fly, and yeah, that that's all basically the same. Wonderful. So so thank you so much, and uh, and again, you will get an email tomorrow with with everything that was presented here today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And thank you, Rick. You're welcome.